Welcome to Things You Don't Know. Today, we're going to take a look at a man who is a study in contradictions. And probably because of that, he's not someone well-known by most people. His name is John Mosby. John Singleton Mosby, actually. Most people have little or no idea who John Mosby was, and even fewer know enough about him to understand why I would want to include his story in this podcast. The few who know who he was may find it a little controversial. Please listen to the entire podcast before we pass judgment, okay? Before we jump into the heart of the podcast, some organizational notes and background information are needed. I learned about Mosby as a child, first through a television series and later through school history lessons, followed by personal investigations, uh, which we'll talk about that. The accepted historical details and, and facts uh, were verified by various resources and the excellent resource of the Encyclopedia Virginia organization. Um, specifically from their entry, uh, John Singleton, um, 1833-1916, which is his birth and death date. As a child growing up in Arlington, Virginia, I was first introduced to information about John Mosby via a television show called The Gray Ghost. Now, the show was only on air for a few years in the 1950s. I think it was like 57, 58, something like that. I still remember the introduction to that show, which started with a picture of Mosby's Rangers cav cavalry group, followed by this voiceover. The Gray Ghost is what they called me. John Mosby was my name. I do not believe the show aired outside the South. The show focused on Mosby's military exploits, but always managed to work into the storyline Mosby's opposition to slavery and how it was wrong, in his words, an abomination. As a child, I had no idea that was unusual. That was a lesson my father had been teaching all of us for as long as I could remember. Now, Mosby and I share some heritage, as we are both sons of Virginia. We both met with prejudice because of that heritage. There is a popular, although I think quite incorrect, idea that people from the South are uneducated, uninformed segregationists, racists, etc. Despite sneaking out, to attend Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech as a child. Look, if you look hard at some of the pictures, you may see two white faces in a sea of darker-skinned celebrants. Yeah, I snuck out and did that. Uh, I was just a kid. Being a friend of Dr. Duncan and visiting many, him many times at Harvard, Howard University and joining the Civil Rights Crusade as a teen, I've often felt that many people from the North make contrarian assumptions concerning me until I have the chance to disavail them of those opinions. Mosby publicly apologized for his family's participation in slavery. He did, as I mentioned before, called slavery a horrible abomination. And he worked to bring about equality and integration after the Civil War. Mosby was a statesman, lawyer, and military leader, both for the USA and for the CSA, and, and the CSA, particularly in the uh, cavalry. For the organization of this podcast, we'll do it in um, two parts. The first is a review of the general life and history of Mosby while the second part will focus on personal and anecdotal information. John Singleton Mosby was the Confederate colonel during the American Civil War, which took place 
between 1861 and 1865. As a private in the 1st Virginia Cavalry, Mosby chose his commander, General Jeb Stuart, as his role model and mentor. Stuart and Confederate General-in-Chief Robert E. Lee came to value Mosby's skills as both a scout and raider. In June 1863, Confederate Secretary of War James A. Seddon permitted Mosby to form and recruit soldiers for Company A, the 43rd Battalion of the Virginia Cavalry, known as the Partisan Rangers. This battalion expanded steadily to the size of a regiment. Approximately 1,900 men served in this command during its existence, and Mosby was accordingly promoted to colonel. The raids of Mosby's men, as they were known, helped to demoralize Union cavalry and rally Southern support for the war. <laughs> Wounded seven times, the combative Mosby disbanded his troops at the end of the war rather than surrender on April 21st, 1865. After the war, he resumed his career as a lawyer. <laughs> Mosby later served as U.S. Counsel to Hong Kong, and from 1904 to 1910, worked as an assistant attorney general in the U.S. Justice Department. An excellent writer, Mosby devoted his later years to letters, articles, and books defending the actions and reputation of his own command, as well as the reputations of Jeb Stuart and Ulysses S. Grant. Mosby died in Washington, D.C. in 1960. Interestingly, the, the date of his death was Memorial Day. Mosby was born on December 6th, 1833, in Powhatan County, Virginia, the second of 11 children. His parents were Virginia McLaurine and Alfred D. Mosby. A very frail child who preferred Greek literature to sports, Mosby was repeatedly bullied, but always fought back, and by his own admission, always lost. In 1815, at the age of 1850, at the age of 16, Mosby entered the University of Virginia, excelling at the classics, English, and debate. He was an accomplished, if reckless, horseman. Although he claimed self-defense, at 19, he was convicted of the non-fatal shooting of a medical student, George Turpin, who was a known bully and involved in many physical incidents. Mosby was expelled from college because of that incident. A man with a very bad reputation Turpin survived. Mosby was sentenced to a year in jail and deciding that justice had not served him well, began reading law while incarcerated. The prosecutor from his trial, William Robertson, helped tutor him the law. Governor Joseph Johnson pardoned Mosby on December 23, 1853. Mosby's status at UVA was eventually restored and he received special commendations from University. Mosby practiced law in Albemarle County from 1855 until 1858. On December 30th, 1856, he married Pauline Clark, the daughter of a prominent Kentucky lawyer and a woman as spirited and intelligent as her husband. By the time of the presidential election of 1860, Mosby and his young family were living in Bristol, Virginia. Mosby disliked the idea of secession and voted for the Unionist Democratic candidate, Stephen A. Douglas. Months earlier, Mosby had joined the Washington Mounted Rifles with the Union in mind. With the secession of Virginia in April 1861, however, the rifles were called into Confederate service. Private Mosby looked to his company commander, West Point graduate William E. Grumble Jones for leadership and military insight. Once the rifles were in Richmond and incorporated into the 1st Virginia Cavalry, Mosby found his new permanent hero, General Jeb Stuart. During the Civil War, Mosby proved himself to be a brilliant strategist and a master at guerrilla warfare. Some of his tactics were actually taught uh, after the war um, in 
yeah, it's known quite well in military annals. He managed to raid and capture Union soldiers, supplies, and materials, such as horses, wagons, and armaments, without being captured. He fought mainly in northern and central Virginia, although he did make several forays into Pennsylvania and other northern states. One of the more famous one of his raids was <clears throat> called the Berryville Wagon Raid of August 13, 1864. In that, Mosby's Rangers captured 200 men, burned or looted 40 wagons, and acquired 420 mules, 200 cattle, and 36 horses. <laughs> it really got under the burr of the saddles of uh, some of the Union commanders and, and kind of frightened them because it was a brilliant strategy that he used. That wagon train had to spread out, traveling all along a river, which was a very bad decision. One does not do that, especially not when you have someone as clever as Mosby hanging around, ready to do something to you. So when they were there, they, they stopped for the night and when the Union forces were woke up in the morning, they were under fire from cannon and other people. Most of the soldiers in that wagon train freaked out and ran away. But as I say, 200 men were captured. Mosby in that, that raid lost Three men. Pretty good strategist, I would say. Now, Union General George A. Custer uh, came into the, the play because he was friends with uh, uh, General Sherman. And Sherman never got over that loss. So he knew he had been thoroughly outclassed and beaten. So anyhow, uh, Union General Custer, as I say, he got very ticked off. So he burned five civilian houses and captured um, four men and decided that it would be a great idea to execute. It wasn't four. It was actually six. Captured uh, those six men and <laughs> Under the aegis of Alfred Torbert, they executed those men. Mosby knew, or he was convinced, that Custer was behind the act. With the death of his mentor, Jeb Stewart, after the Battle of Yellow Tavern in May of uh, 1864, Mosby was left to make the case for his actions directly to Robert E. Lee and ask permission to deal likewise with the enemy. Lee reluctantly gave his permission, and in November, Mosby had seven prisoners of war executed. Well, actually, the, the history on that has been somewhat confused because, yeah, uh, there were seven men that were scheduled to be executed. However, one of them was a Union soldier who was um, actually 15, I believe. And Mosby said, not killing him, not happening. Uh, and another one had um, a situation with his family that, that he m made his case uh, to Mosby. And Mosby said, I'm not, I'm not killing him either. So actually it was five that were um, executed. And Mosby then contacted the command, the Union command, and arranged a pact ensuring that prisoners 
from both sides would be treated uh, humanely and not be executed. Now, that pact was followed by both sides through the rest of the war. Uh, and one of the other things that happened right around this time, on December 21st, 64, 1864, Mosby was ambushed near Rectortown by Union cavalry who had no idea who he was. Now, though Mosby was seriously wounded in the stomach, the injury was incorrectly reported as fatal in the New York Herald. Now, Sheridan was happy as a pig in slop over that. He was delighted. He was somewhat humiliated by his uh, delight and and in, in the fact that, quote, Mosby had been killed when it was found that not only was he not killed, but he got back into the action and, and, and proceeded to humiliate Union forces several different times after that. After the war ended, as was the case with many generals and officers on both sides, Mosby became a very good friend with general and future president Ulysses Grant, despite Mosby's disapproval of Grant's excessive use of alcohol. Actually, one of the things about that that's, that's rather interesting is Mosby was a teetotaler, did not touch down alcohol at all, and yet he was really close with, with Grant. The former combatants became such good friends that in his memoirs, Grant wrote, Mosby was an intelligent, honorable man who he considered a good friend with whom he grew to be very close. This friendship and commitment to reconciliation did not please many partisans both in North and South, and it is undoubtedly one of the reasons Mosby is not better known today. And, you know, after the war, Mosby served in uh, United States government positions, and he took his his service to the government very seriously. I mean, he was a man who said, when he said he was committed to something, he was committed to it. And when he was working for the United States government, he was fundamental in uncovering financial improprieties, shall we say, both in Asia and other places. He, he found in Asia that the ambassador was shipping opium to the United States under the heading of food supply and paying a dollar twenty-five in taxes when he was pocketing ten thousand dollars per year, which is a lot of money back in that, that those days. It, it's you know roughly like twenty grand or so by today's. So he also, when he, he came back from uh, being in uh, Asia, Hong Kong, to be more specific, he went to um, San Francisco and he found more corruption and embezzling there. Well, it speaks to his character that he didn't overlook these sort of things and spoke up for justice and the things he believed in. I know there's a lot more detailed information concerning Mosby, but Dr. Weaver, if I may, I'm really interested in some of the anecdotal and personal information. I, too, was born in Virginia, but not raised there, so I don't have access to everything you did. But you have shared some very interesting tidbits that I think would be very interesting to our listeners. <laughs> well, thanks. You know, I already mentioned my very early introduction to John Mosby, but that was really added to very significantly when I was 18. Uh, my high school was right across from a small forest area, and there were all kinds of stories, you know, how kids will talk, about an old railroad line that ran up a steep grade between two cliffs, not, not huge high cliffs, but cliffs. 
And it was said that Mosby had raided Union supply trains there. And the reason? Tracks, the railroad tracks crossed on a bridge, it, which no longer exists, uh, by the way, from Washington, D.C. to Arlington, Virginia. Okay, now, some of my friends uh, and I, we just had to go explore and see. Well, we found the tracks, which at that time, remember this was quite a while ago, uh, still being used by some freight trains. Now, the spot which they had talked about, there were these legends that I had heard, that was most fascinating was where the track ran, ran between two cliffs. Now, you got to understand that this was a very steep grade that went up to that. Uh, so it meant that probably back in those days, the trains were going pretty slow when they came through there. So anyhow, there's a, there was a, a tree, a big old tree, that had a branch that grew out over the tracks. It had a rope attached to it. So we took to swinging between the cliffs on that rope. <laughs> Yeah, uh, probably not the smartest things, but okay. Uh, we also explored the area and in, uh, found several different caves. Some of them were quite kind of hidden. <clears throat> and, and when we found one of those caves, it had material from the Civil War area in it. Like, it wasn't many things, but... Um, like uh, some shell casings and um, some boxes, which are what were heavily deteriorated, and um, a, a, a canteen kind of thing. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that that was one of the caves where Mosby hid supplies while he was waiting, transporting the supplies from the trains that he raided uh, to take to. Um, Confederate um, forces. Now, you got you, you to gotta picture what he was doing. He never got captured. He, he, he was raiding these trains, and he wasn't killing the people um, that, that were running the trains. He figured they weren't military for the most part, although there were soldiers on the trains, but they always just surrendered. And taking the supplies and squirreling them away in these caves. I mean, I just found it, even back then, to be very interesting. Wow. I, I, I can just imagine how interesting and exciting that was as a young teen to be exploring around there. Uh, I'm curious, do you know how many times Mosby raided trains uh, or how many supplies he took? You know, I have not been able to get reliable verification of the data. But from what I have been able to gather, Mosby rated that train somewhere between five and 15 times. Um, and I've heard so many different estimates of the amount of food, ammunition, rifles, and cannons that he captured that I just don't trust the, the uh, data at all. So he also, apparently he took some prisoners in some of those train raids and use them to exchange them for captured Confederate soldiers. Strikes me as a warrior in the best sense of that word, a, a real knight errant, as they used to say. What intrigued me, I did some research on my own, was how he, he made several attempts, even at quite an advanced age, to resume a military career. He offered his services to the government as did Union General and Maine Governor Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain during the Cuban-Spanish-American War in 1898. He was a consultant to a man called Christian DeWitt, who was the great uh, Boer commander of the South African forces in Boer War at that time. But this is even more amazing. Two years prior to his death, in 1914, at the age of 81, he offers to enlist and command troops for the British in the beginning of the First World War. 
he writes to King George V personally asking for a command. This is a man in his 80s, good heavens. What also impressed me is coming out of a Confederate background, he had extremely, in, in I mean this in a good sense because this word has a mixed meaning, progressive attitudes. Uh, like James Longstreet, he strongly resented the attempt to strip African-American men of the vote in most parts of the South. He regarded that as both stupid and immoral. He has supported Colonel Patrick Claiborne's efforts during the war to free and arm uh, former slaves to fight on the Confederate side. He deeply criticized President Woodrow Wilson for both his political views, uh, particularly an income tax, which he regarded as immoral, and Wilson's terrible racism, the glorification of Thomas Dixon's horrible book, The Klansman, which has turned into the film Birth of a Nation, which is full of every racial stereotype and prejudice thing you could think of. But I, the more I, I read and, and learn about Mosby, the more impressed I am, because in a world of compromise and, and self-interest, he spends eight and a half decades upholding the ideas and principles he believed in. And such statesmanship and dedication to truth is very lacking, is lacking and very badly needed in this chaotic world we live in today. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be a part of this and to have told this long needed to be told story. Yeah, it is. It is interesting. Just as a, a parting aside here, <clears throat> you know, I've seen some of the places where uh, Mosby lived, particularly his, his house in house in uh, Bristol, Virginia, which has been preserved. Um, and I, I wanted to add a, another little tidbit here. You know, Mosby uh, lost his wife, whom he obviously was very devoted to and was left as a 43-year-old man with uh, five children. And, you know, he maintained his family um, responsibilities to the end. Well, look, um, we can go on and on. And there's a lot more information, I know. But we certainly appreciate you listening. And hopefully you picked up a few tidbits that you hadn't really known and hopefully have gained some insight into this rather remarkable man. I hope that you will give us a like and subscribe. And if you want to leave comments, please do. We love reading them. And another thing that I wanted to say is have you ever had an idea that you might like to participate in doing a podcast or learn about doing a podcast? If so, you just struck gold. Give us a shout out, leave us a comment, contact us, and you know we will do our best to include you. I cannot agree more, friends. This has been a wonderful experience, and we want to share it with both listeners and other people who may wish to participate. Thank you very much. All righty. Goodbye for now. So long.